Hey, everybody. And I'm all blurry. I don't oh, know. that's all right. Uh, welcome to okay, All Set for Sunday, a podcast for busy and distracted Catholics to be a little more prepared for Sunday Mass. My name is Scott Williams. My co host is Jeff Trailer. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Scott. I feel like we just did this. Uh, we didn't. We did it a week ago. <laughs> it was a full week ago. Yes. <laughs> and you're wearing the same clothes. Yes. <laughs> and we have the same priests here. Wearing the same clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Uh, <laughs> anyways, Father Jeff Dufresne, how are you today? I'm great. It's good to be back. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for doing a, a two for uh, recording with us. I'm going on vacation. So when this yeah. airs, I'll be on a on a beach but more likely probably under a shaded uh, umbrella of some sort with white stuff all over your nose and a long yeah, sleeve long, shirt on long sleeve swim shirt. I've got an issue with sunburns. I, I do too. I can sympathize with that. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I don't go to the beach. What did you say? What kind of, you have what kind of skin Who? That, you, that you don't, you don't burn. Oh, I've got uh good Greek skin, Greek skin. Yeah. Yes. I got Middle Greek. Eastern skin. I got Greek yogurt. So <laughs> it's not helpful <laughs> okay didn't help with sunburns also it didn't help my sunburn this past weekend two weekends ago sorry because yeah. of when we're recording right yeah indianapolis 500 yeah i got a little bit a little bit of burn oh. up in there yeah ouch it happened it, it'll tan out in a couple of days i'll be good yep all right speaking of tanning out let's jump into the two minute drill let's that is speaking of tan and out. That's good. Yep. We haven't had a real good segue from you in a while. That was Thank nice you. work. Thanks. Uh, it is the solemnity of the most holy body and blood of Christ, otherwise known as what, Scott? Uh, Corpus Christi Sunday. Corpus Christi Sunday. Oh, I forgot. Real, before we do this. Oh. Are you going to do your ad read? Oh, I didn't prepare it. No. Okay. Next time. We'll just transfer those ad dollars to the next. Yes. <laughs> sorry another unsponsored podcast yeah we... i forgot about that hey all right i need to i need to I put that on my thought, calendar i thought the ad read for a second was real on the episode with father marshall <laughs> like i was listening to it and i was like this is the perfect ad i don't know how that oh yeah this is probably for dry fit stretch yeah. uh Cassocks. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> We're gonna start doing fake ad reads for this many episodes. Yeah. So again. once we get off here, if you have some products that you think we should do a fake ad read, feel free to feed them this way. Um, but all right, it is Corpus Christi Sunday, Solemnity of the Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ. I'm a big believer in like let's read the full titles of these. <laughs> They're gonna I'm, say the Eucharist. Oh, a big believer in the Eucharist. Big Eucharist big guy. Big time Eucharist guy. <laughs> Huge real presence guy right here. This is cool. Um, which is good for this Sunday. But we are on a run of solemnities here. I did, I was looking. So coming off Pentecost, we have six of like seven weeks. We mm -hmm. have some sort of like celebration on Sunday other than it just being, yeah. just being a Sunday. And a solemnity that is a Sunday. So that's pretty exciting stuff. I wouldn't have it any other way. And <laughs> I, I wouldn't have a choice. Yeah, so yeah. that's what we're going to do. Um, our first reading comes from Deuteronomy. We got Moses back at it again here. Um, Moses is talking to his people, reminding them of the 40 years uh, that God directed them and journeyed them through the desert and that he brought them out of the, or out of the land of Egypt, away from slavery, into the desert, and then gave them the manna when they were lost and, and really just reminding them of this journey and this experience that they've been on. Uh, our Psalm is praise the Lord. Oh, Jeru or praise the Lord, comma, Jerusalem. Sorry. I don't know why I said, Oh, praise the Lord, Jerusalem, comma, or hallelujah, comma, period. There's no comma, just the period. Hallelujah. Just end. Um, that's Psalm 147. Our second reading, a real shorty here, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17. Um, but on this Corpus Christi Sunday, a nice reminder that the cup we bless is uh, is the blood of Christ, that the bread we break is the body of Christ, and that we are all to partake in one loaf. Um, this, this one loaf of bread, many parts, one body, 
we're all there. And then we do have it's a sequence, Scott. Oh, sequence alert. Yeah. Got it. Oh, hang on. It's a sequence alert. Uh, and as we were talking about before the podcast, but I wanted to save my joke, this sequence must be from Boston. Oh, yeah? Because it's called Lauda Scion. <laughs> Ooh. Like louder is the joke, people, but it's Lauda Scion. I'm not going to read the whole sequence. So um, there is a short form, um, but we still won't read it, but it'll be a good sequence. Um, and then our gospel reading, the gospel comes from John chapter 6, 51 to 58. Jesus said to the Jewish crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled amongst themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, amen, amen. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent, has sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds me on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate it and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. All right. Did Jeff get anything wrong, Father Dufresne? Not that I heard. I thought the explanation of the sequence was particularly <laughs> excellent. I borrowed it from you. Lauda. <laughs> Lauda Zion. Can you preach on the I thought maybe on you the borrowed sequence? it. You sure. Sure. Why not? Yeah. yeah, what the heck? All right. Bet you won't. You won't. No. I'm Three not. parts on the No. <laughs> We've got a one word homily. One one word. All right. We're gonna wrap word. this up quickly. Ooh, can we guess? You can guess. Loud. <laughs> Louda. And then you sit down. <laughs> um, I'll bet that joke won't. I want you to say parish. I want you to say amen louda when you receive <laughs> Holy Communion. No, not louda. Uh, mm, nope. No. I, I, I don't know. Mystery. <laughs> She's like, he's about to say it. Let me just say something. Um, remember. Hmm. Remember. This is I like one of my favorite scenes in all of childhood movies is uh, from The Lion King. You know, when, when Simba, like he's just like met Rafiki, right? And he has this, he has this vision in the clouds of his father Mufasa, right? And Mufasa says, remember who you are, right? It's like this, this turning point, this conversion that happens in the movie. Well, that's not going to be part of my homily, but oh, it it's what be. this word makes me think of, right? It doesn't play the same in Spanish. Oh. Um, I'm sit there and just, ah, it's like, <laughs> that might be copyrighted. You might want to be careful. Ooh. I don't think my pitch is copyrighted <laughs> on that. But remember, Spoke right? And this, I went in, <laughs> I went in and I looked at the eighth chapter of Deuteronomy, which is where the first mm. reading comes from, right? Yeah, we were and that this early. is Moses talking to the Israelites about all these things God has done for them, right? Remember God. Remember God who did this. Remember God who did this, right? And that it's so important because as you look at the story of the Israelites, every disaster that comes about for the Israelites comes about because they forgot God, right? It comes about because they either became kind of lax in the their religion or their relationship with God became secondary or because they outright rejected it and followed like worshiped idols, right? So remember. And I think this word remember is important for us because we are we are on this day, on Corpus Christi Sunday, we are beginning the second phase of the National Eucharistic Revival, right? We're beginning the parish year, which is going to be a lot of people's first, probably, 
unfortunately going to be a lot of, for a lot of people, the first time they've heard of like this Eucharistic revival. Yeah. There's right? a lot of people that don't know about it. And, yeah. and I think what people might wonder uh, is why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. Right. For a lot of people, there's going to be that question of, first of all, what's a revival? And second of all, why are we doing it? Cause that's what we ask whenever there's some kind of new thing or, or program or whatever. Well, why are, why did we get to the point that we needed a Eucharistic revival, a revival and renewal of our Eucharistic faith? Well, it's because we've forgotten a lot of things, right? It's because we've forgotten what, really, who the Eucharist is and what God gave it to us for, right? And so these things that we need to remember, first of all, like what God has done for us, right? He has saved us in Christ Jesus by his life, death, and resurrection and opened the doors of heaven for us, right? He's forgiven our sins and made it possible for us to enter into heaven. But then what is what is the Eucharist in that? Why, why the Eucharist? Why not just live, die, go to heaven? Well, in the second reading, we see, because because I think for a lot of us, like the Eucharist has just become so familiar, so routine that we've forgotten, right? Um, this is what happens a lot of times in human relationships. Like when there's a little bit of friction between spouses or when, you know, there are, there are wounds in family or friend relationships, it's like, they're they're taking me for granted, right? They're they've forgotten like who I am to them, right? And so we've done this with Jesus. And so what do we need to remember? First of all, that uh, God has saved us, and we need God to save us. We can't save ourselves. Second of all, what is what is the Eucharist? What does Saint Paul say? He doesn't say the cup of blessing that we bless is the blood of Christ. Now. He means to communicate that, but how does he communicate it? The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So I think a lot of times, many of us, and I've fallen into this a lot in my life, we we come up, we receive Holy Communion, um, we say amen. Then we go out, we leave church, we go to brunch, we go, we go to the football game, we go, we go wherever we go, right? And it's like, well, I received communion. I heard, I heard a good word, hopefully, at church, and and we're good. I can go on and live the rest of my life this week and then come back next week, maybe. Well, that's not a participation, right? So if the reception of Holy Communion is a participation in the body and blood of Christ. That means I go forward, I receive Holy Communion after having prepared to receive Holy Communion, right? So I receive Holy Communion worthily. And then that Holy, that moment of communion with Christ in the sacrament determines the rest of what I do that week. Now, does that mean I stay in church all week and I'm just all about Jesus? No. It means Holy Communion, that participation in the body and blood of Christ transforms who we are and what we do in every aspect of our life so that we become what we eat. We become Jesus. Like this is the thing, ultimately what we've forgotten besides how important, how much we need Jesus is that we are Jesus. Like you are Jesus. By your baptism, you have died with Christ and risen with Christ. And by participating in the body and blood of Christ, you are transformed. Like most all other foods, we make those foods into into more of us, right? But like our body breaks it down and turns it into muscle or fat or energy or whatever it is, right? With the Eucharist, it's different. The Eucharist actually turns us into Jesus when we eat it, Mm -hmm. right? So that's... That's something that we've forgotten. So we need to remember. We need to remember what God has done for us uh, and that the Eucharist is a participation in the life of Christ. Um, and then I think there are a lot of things we need to remember. Like there, there, this is what the Eucharistic revival is. This is what the bishops are talking about, right? Um, renewing our appreciation for our reverence, for our love for the Eucharist. Um but 
we need to remember these words of Jesus. Like, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. So this, just period, right? No qualification, no. And and this is an, an urgent and important message. And one of the things I preach in my parish a lot, because we have a lot of people for various reasons that don't receive Holy Communion, um, like hardly ever because of their different life situations, they they kind of get complacent in that. And so a lot of times I preach like, hey, remember, like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. Like, we don't want to get complacent in this state of, well, Jesus loves me and I can't receive communion right now and I'll I'll get married next year or I'll do that annulment next year or I'll do whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or I'll go to confession like, ah, I can do it next week. Like, And the the other thing, the thing I preach usually at English masses is like, you know, we actually need to prepare to receive Jesus worthily. Like you can eat my flesh and drink my blood, um, like using Jesus's words. Um, but you, if you do that unworthily, if you do that when you're not actually in communion with him, then you don't have life within you either. Like we need to receive Holy Communion worthily, which means like going to confession if we have unconfessed mortal sins like it's, preparing prayerfully for holy communion yeah it's like not that. a passive experience exactly it has to be it's a you participation have, it has to be participating you said that that was good no oh. come back around to it i this is so those are my thoughts just the I electric like trick method the metric <laughs> method yeah do we do that no the the loop the lonergan loop or the lowry loop lowry loop lowry loop father brockmeyer will love that you said lonergan i, I thought yeah I just said just the playing the crowd. Yes. <laughs> um, the That's Leonardo cute. loop. The Leonardo. I, this is, I very much like that message. This is dumb brain, Jeff. Sorry. I'm just off shooting here. Uh, this gospel reading, I just think, I always want to point out, we're 2,000 years into this faith, right? And into this understanding. We're having this revival because people, because much of it coming out of the research that's been done and the the witness that priests like you have within the church of people not believing in the true presence of the Eucharist. But these Jewish crowds, like, I just want, sometimes I put myself in their minds of like, I think they get a bad rap here of like, people are like, why weren't they listening to Jesus? And it's like, yeah, but they didn't fully know who he was. And like, if you just, if you just walked in someplace and somebody said this statement to you, I would also uh, quarrel amongst myself and and be like, wait a second, why is this guy just many times over repeating that we should eat his body and drink his blood? Like that's some weird stuff. But obviously, it, there's more depth to it now. Yeah. This is not related to the hom- you, I just think I, I just remember wrote, when I was a kid. I don't know if it's um, is is that phrase like whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I is that currently in a eucharistic prayer or was it previously before the translations changed um i don't believe that i don't believe that those words are in a a eucharistic prayer that i regularly use okay there are there are enough that i don't regularly use that it I feel like growing up, I heard that phrase a lot and it kind of freaked me out, like as a kid, like as a kid, but I also didn't know like what Jeff just said. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't have a full understanding of, of who I mean, th- that is or how that played out in my life. And I, I wonder like, how can I do a better job of raising my children to, to both like know the gravity of, of who Jesus is in the Eucharist, but also not be scared about this particular phrasing. I don't know. I think what what I would say to to parents of younger children is that your children understand the reality of the Eucharist better than you do. Mm-hmm. Because they like I believe firmly that children, especially children who are not yet at the age of reason and so are the future. Like are <laughs> teach them wrong. Don't let them yes, be afraid. We are the world. Um <laughs> Uh, uh, excuse me i firmly believe that um that children experience spiritual realities at a level that we cannot appreciate as adults because of their innocence um so i would say there are two things one um valuing 
and protecting your your children's innocence to a reasonable level, right? So don't give your child a smartphone when they're eight years old. That's not a prudent thing to do in in my humble estimation, right? Because they're, I mean, what are they going to encounter? A lot of things that will lead them away from God. The second thing I would say is just encourage them to have a trusting relationship with God, right? Because we can hear these words of Jesus with two different, probably many different, but I can think of two different perspectives that you can hear them with, right? You can have a perspective of skepticism, like, oh, this guy's got to prove something to me. Um, And when he says this, it's like, no, you got to say more, like you got to explain it, Um, which is, it's not wrong to, to desire to understand more deeply, but that if we listen to the words of the Lord with skepticism, um, instead of with faith, we might not understand them according to the faith of the church, right? So you can also, like, these are not just random people that walked up and heard Jesus speaking in the synagogue on this mm-hmm. day. Like, Scripture gives us the impression that these are people who had walked with him. Like, and you go through the Gospel of John, and what have they seen, right? Mm. They have seen all of these signs. They've seen the the feeding of the the multiplication of the loaves and and they've seen this these miracles and so i i think we do need to be compassionate and understanding with them but we also need to say like they had a lot to go on here to know that this wasn't just some random guy okay right right so if you're listening to the lord with with ears and a heart of faith you might be more ready to take that next step with them when i think when he says something that seems outlandish yeah. to our human intellect. And like when we know these things to be true, that skepticism that comes up in us or that doubt, like that's a tool of the devil. That's a tool of, of Satan trying to confuse us, trying to make us second guess this, trying to ask for more and for more and for more. And what he does in this gospel is give them more and more and more. It's not once. He doesn't say it one time. He says it four, five, six different ways in here. So. Yeah. So remember, that's what I would say. Remember <laughs> who Jesus is for you. Remember what the Eucharist is, that it is Jesus present to you, body and blood, soul and divinity. And remember that you are Jesus. Maybe you should find it in between and the word should be remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I held on to that one for a long time. I giggled okay. like as soon as you said the word earlier. Tucked that one away. All right. All right. Did we do dumb questions already? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Just dumb comments. Dumb, oh, Jeff. That's yeah. right. Dumb brain. Dumb yeah. brain, Jeff. Now yeah. it's dumb questions. All right. Dumb questions. First off, speaking of Lauda, Scion, where where does this come from? Where does this sequence come? Where do sequences come from, Father? Sequences come from the missile? It's a mystery. <laughs> I I actually don't know the when the script things. and the theologian love each other very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm ju- I, I'm ju- I was genuinely all of a sudden looking at this and like the cadence it's written in and like I mean it it is poetic and so I d- I don't personally know off the top of my head the the story of the origins of the the Corpus Christi sequence. I know that many of our Eucharistic hymns were written by Saint Thomas Aquinas. So it's it's possible that this was one of his compositions, but I, I can't say definitively. And probably there are priests listening to this that are like screaming at the top of their lungs, like this, it's this, it's this. Um, but I don't have that information. Just <laughs> it was composed by St. Thomas Aquinas, a renowned theologian and doctor of the church in the 13th century. Nice. There we go. I can't, off the top of your head, Scott, that was good. Yeah. So guys, you can stop screaming because I was right. So you were right. (laughs) Thank you, Scott. It's very validating. Thank you. I was curious about that. But also like Thomas, I mean, Thomas Aquinas, way with words, like Mm -hmm. that guy could write. But there's there's a real good, as I was reading through this, there's just a really beautiful cadence to how he wrote this. And anyway, good for him. Next dumb question. All right. over the centuries, it has been oh, said to various just... musical compositions and oh. performed by different musical styles, ranging from Gregorian chant to ska polyphonic settings by renowned composers. Oh, and the sequences are their poetry that help to 
deepen our understanding of the mystery that's being celebrated. It's a rich theological content. <laughs> Stop like reading your... <laughs> that might be copyright. Continue to inspire worshipers and musicians alike. Make Did you use AI piece. to find this answer? Of sacred music within the Catholic you Church. You used AI to find this answer. I'm just, I'm just trying to be a contributor to uh, the podcast. Thank you. I can't imagine a priest more freaked out by AI than Father Dufresne, and you're over here just taking theology from I don't think freaked out is the right word. No? No. Dumb question. How do you feel about AI? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know very much about it. Um, you should just type it in there. It'll tell you all about it. I don't know very much about it. I, I don't think it's a great idea, um, but I... I've heard that it's useful for some things. So, yeah, I think you're also going to have to deal with it. I'm satisfied with my very. That was, I feel like that was a par. Uh, what my wife said when she married me. You're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, I don't think it's useful for some things, but I hear it can be helpful every once in a while. <laughs> um, uh, those aren't the vows that I remember. No. <laughs> Were um, you at Jeff's wedding? No. No. Oh, okay. You just know the that, same at yeah. all the weddings. Yeah. I know. <laughs> years too all the orthodox ones anyway yeah the valid ones all right well, there's, um, there's options okay second dumb question on this corpus christi sunday i asked this and i and this popped into my head because of when you were talking about if somebody's not worthy to receive if they've not prepared to receive everything then then they don't receive return like that what did you what was the phrase you used they don't um well, the St. Paul and the tradition of the church would say they receive unto condemnation instead mm -hmm. of unto salvation. So if we eat and drink the body and blood of Christ when we're not in a state of grace, we're eating and drinking our own damnation yeah. is what they what St. Paul would say. Right. That brings some new insight to this question. So I was at a uh, mass the other day, a celebration of the Eucharist um, for my daughter's graduation, the baccalaureate mass. And... There, I watched somebody receive communion who very clearly did not know what they were doing. And then I watched them carry a host back to the pew. And then I started to stand up and my wife was like, don't make a scene. And I was like, but I'm not like that person isn't going to pocket Jesus, but then they consumed it. And I'm, I'm just curious, like at times I've like laughed about like, well, then I just watched that person get their first communion. But like, what is, what was my, what should I have done there? Should I have just immediately stopped that person and well, asked there, the question? There are a range of things that should have happened before yes, you have to get But what's my responsibility in that scenario where I see this play out? I would say if you And there were instructions given by the priest, but I think we've also always seen people, you know, I think we've all seen people who just decide, you know, no, I do want to receive today. Are either of you extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion? I, I am not. Currently, but I have been trained and have done it in the past. So I would say first thing for you all who have been or are extraordinary ministers and anyone listening, like you are the first line of defense for to prevent against the desecration of the Holy Eucharist, which is what sounds like almost happened in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. So as soon as you receive a ciborium or a patent to distribute Holy Communion or you're, you receive the chalice, you are responsible for who you whom you distribute to so if you're a minister and someone looks like they obviously don't know what they're doing it's i would encourage you with your after consulting with your pastor to ask them like are you catholic like be hospitable be kind but mm -hmm. don't you have no responsibility to just give jesus to everybody that comes up because we don't want to desecrate the holy eucharist right um if you're in the pews and you witness something like that, I would, I would encourage you with like, if the defenses fail, right. Mm -hmm. And something sneaks through, somebody didn't notice or whatever, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, gently with kindness and charity, I would say, approach the person, um, be very deferential and just say, Hey, I noticed you haven't consumed our Lord yet. Like, are you Catholic? Um, and and just at, ask them like first option would be for them to like return the host but just ask them to like either give you the host or to or to consume the host like um because again yeah desecration of the eucharist is a 
sin reserved to the Holy See for a reason. Yes. It can seriously damage your soul. So we want to we want to prevent people from damaging their relationship with Jesus by doing something um, out of ignorance. That is, they... is desecration of the Eucharist anything outside of receiving it? Or is it like deliberate and intentional act of... So it would be deliberately and intentionally treating the Eucharist in, in an inappropriate way. But if somebody was like, pocket. hey, I don't know, I don't know what this is. I just went we, through a line we and I would, just put it in my pocket. I just did what I everybody know. else was doing. We would say that the action is objectively what the action is, like desecration of the Holy Eucharist. Their culpability for that before God might be mm-hmm. reduced by invincible ignorance. But if the priest has said five seconds ago what it is and who should receive, mm-hmm. you don't have invincible ignorance. But, but it does take I, seven times for someone to hear something the first time. So. <sighs> But uh, so yeah, I would say that that's that would be the moral. So if it was in the bulletin, the priest said it. <laughs> Stop. And Stop. Uh yeah. Invincible ignorance might be my new uh favorite phrase. I'll probably misuse it, but I really like that phrase. There you um go. like that the title of the show. Invincible ignorance. It'll be in the show notes. Um, invincible so bottom line <laughs> invincible <laughs> ignorance with <laughs> bottom line is like is remember and if you've heard remember anything that makes you think of situations that may have happened in your life by commission or omission like go to confession and the priest will help you yes so, jesus right. loves you receive jesus and remember go to confession to, first if needed to uh subscribe to the pod Mm-hmm. Go on over to the YouTubes, subscribe there. And you know what? If you're feeling a little, uh, I don't know, spicy, share it. Yeah, share it. Be invincibly ignorant. It's just also, share it out with others. It's people. also been a long time since anybody has reviewed the podcast on Ooh. the Apples. So if you review the podcast on the Apples iTunes, um, we, we, will, we will read it on the next episode. Ooh. And we'll pick the best one and give you a pair of socks. I love it. I'm in. Is that good? Yep. You good with that, Father? That sounds awesome. Sweet. All right. right. Bye, y'all. I'm going to review the podcast. (laughs) And stop. Stop the recording. There was a little while where I would do that, and it would cause the whole thing to, like, glitch, and just and going, Scott would get really mad about it.